Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is Endgame Part 1. Over the next week, this mini-series of three episodes concludes the War of Independence series, which started 12 months ago. These three compelling episodes look at the final months of the war. It's a thrilling story that puts you back in a ruthless world. The Irish Republican movement remained defiant as the British government were determined to preserve the empire at all costs. Now, whether you've followed the story through the ambushes, raids and battles up to this point in all 22 episodes in the series, or you're just joining at this point, you'll still enjoy these shows. Sound was by Jason Looney. Additional research is from Sam McGrath. And additional narrations are by Aidan Crow and Therese Murray. Part 3 of Endgame comes out next Monday, and it'll be the last of the 25 episodes in this series. Overall, the series will be about 15 hours of free content, and the people who deserve a very special mention are the show supporters. If you translated the work involved in this series into a book, it would have had a word count of about 140,000 words, which is pretty sizable. Now, writing these episodes was often a challenge, and it was only possible because of the support of listeners on Acast Plus and Patreon, who gave me the time I needed. Researching the series in the middle of a pandemic was always a challenge. Libraries were often closed or operating with limited services. However, with your support, I was able to buy many of the texts needed. I was also able to bring Sam and Jason on board while it was possible to have Aidan and Therese feature in every episode. This was crucial to the success of the series. I've learned a lot and I have exciting plans for the coming months, including a five-part series on a murder from the 19th century. That's going to be a deep dive into daily life before the famine. Then there's another series on the way that's about the Bruce invasion, a 14th century war. Whether you love medieval history or you're just curious, that's a fantastic story. I've also individual episodes on topics such as Grania Whale, the 16th century pirate queen, and what it was like to survive on a medieval diet. I'm actually going to try that for a few days. So that's all in the works as well. If you're not a supporter, but you like the show and want to hear more, you can support my work on Patreon and Acast Plus. It's really easy to sign up. There's links in the show notes below. Now to Endgame Part 1. We pick up the story in early 1921. The British Crown forces have declared martial law across the entire province of Munster, along with Kilkenny and Wexford, in an effort to dramatically escalate the war. By February 1921, there were few men in Ireland more powerful than Lieutenant General Peter Strickland. A few months earlier, in an effort to escalate their war, against the IRA, the British government had declared martial law across eight of Ireland's southernmost counties, and the 51-year-old Strickland had been appointed as military governor. This granted him powers far beyond that of any politician over the million or so people who lived in the eight counties under military rule. For example, military courts could pass death sentences in a range of offences, some of which had been relatively minor, in peacetime. Now Strickland had been chosen for this role because of his ruthlessness and experience. While he had served on the Western Front during World War I, after the war he had been the commander of the British forces that occupied the Rhineland in Germany. Strickland, known as old hungry face to his men, wouldn't balk when faced with the tough decisions like overseeing death sentences or reprisal attacks against the wider population. However, nothing could prepare the man for the dilemma he faced in late February 1921. A sentry at the Victoria Barracks in Cork City, where his headquarters were located, had picked up a letter that had been surreptitiously dropped outside the barracks, but addressed to the Lieutenant General. When he opened it, Strickland recognised the writing as that of Maria Georgina Lindsay, a personal friend of his from the Cork area. She had been missing for nine days by this point, although it was widely suspected she had been kidnapped by the IRA. While he could take comfort from the fact that the letter was proof she was still alive, this relief faded rapidly as he read through the words in front of him. In the closing lines of the letter, the 59-year-old Lindsay pleaded with Strickland to save her life and exchange her for five IRA volunteers in his custody. I am a prisoner, as I'm sure you will know, and... 
I have been told that it will be a very serious matter for me if these men are executed. I have been told that my life will be forfeited for theirs, as they believe that I was the direct cause of their capture. I implore you to spare these men for my sake. Now Strickland was well acquainted with the background to why Lindsay found herself in such peril. Four weeks previously, she had learned that the IRA were planning an ambush near her home in Dripsy, outside Cork City. Lindsay, a staunch Unionist, informed the Crown forces, who mobilised a large number of soldiers and in turn surrounded the IRA ambush. While the majority of the IRA volunteers present did manage to escape, it had proven a significant victory for the Crown forces. One Republican had been killed while five more were taken prisoner. Given the county was under martial law at the time, these five men were tried by court-martial and sentenced to death. They were the men Maria Lindsay had referred to in her letter. On learning of Lindsay's role in these events, the IRA had acted swiftly. They raided the Lindsay home and took her and her driver prisoner before burning the building to the ground. The letter dropped to the Victoria Barracks had, as we have heard, offered the 59-year-old's life for that of the five IRA volunteers taken at the Dripsy ambush. However, while Lindsay may have been a personal friend to Strickland, this was a time of war and the decisions about what to do could not be divorced from the military situation he faced in early 1921. Since the imposition of martial law two months earlier, the British Crown forces had adopted an extremely aggressive approach towards the Republican movement. Volunteers, as we have seen, were tried in court-martials and numerous death sentences were handed down. Increasingly, on the back foot, the IRA were now using Lindsay to try and curb this ruthless campaign. From Strickland's point of view, a prisoner exchange was dangerous. He only had to look back to March 1920 to see where it could lead. Back then, IRA prisoners in Mountjoy Jail had gone on hunger strike to secure the release of prisoners and the British administration had relented to their demand. This predictably inspired hunger strikes in several prisons across Ireland and Britain and eventually hundreds of Irish Republicans were released. This had really only ended when the Lord Mayor of Cork, Terence McSweeney, had died on hunger strike in Brixton Jail in October. In early 1921, Strickland knew a prisoner exchange which would see five IRA volunteers spared in return for the life of Maria Lindsay could precipitate a similar reaction and the IRA might start kidnapping others to save the lives of volunteers in British captivity. Perhaps it was due to his own personal connections to the case that Strickland decided to consult his superior, General Neville McCready, the commander-in-chief in Ireland, about what to do. After deliberating on the matter, Strickland and McCready decided to call the IRA's bluff. They would press ahead and execute the five prisoners in the Victoria Barracks in Cork. They presumably questioned whether the IRA would really execute a 59-year-old widow and her driver in retaliation, an act that even the most ardent Republicans would struggle to defend. So two days after receiving the letter from Maria Lindsay, on February 28, 1921, Six IRA volunteers, the five captured at Tripsy, along with one other, were taken from their cells and executed. Strickland could now only wait. No one knew for certain how the IRA would react. Had this been a year earlier, it would have been very difficult to imagine them executing a middle-aged widow. They had, after all, allowed Brigadier General Cuthbert Lucas escape rather than execute him after he had been kidnapped in the summer of 1920. Lucas had even described his captors as gentlemen. However, since then, the war, particularly the war in Cork, had changed considerably. The factors and experiences that would decide the fate of Maria Lindsay were shaped by the escalation of the conflict into a far more brutal and bitter war. There was unquestionably a growing sense among the Cork IRA that the war was turning against them in the first quarter of 1921. And this did not bode well for Maria Lindsay. Cork and the surrounding region had been nothing short of traumatised by the escalation of the war from late 1920 onwards. The death of Terence McSweeney, the Kilmichael ambush and the burning of Cork City had set the stage for a dramatic escalation in the conflict in 1921. 
After the declaration of martial law in December 1920, the British Army had far greater latitude to launch much larger operations involving hundreds of soldiers. However, by this point, the IRA was also putting larger numbers into the field. This had arisen from the fact that growing numbers of volunteers were on the run and unable to sleep in their own homes or go to work. This effectively had made them full-time revolutionaries. Organised into flying columns or active service units, these ranged from 20 to 30, all the way up to 100 men in some cases, allowing them to plan much larger actions. However, despite this, during the early months of 1921, the IRA had suffered several major setbacks in Cork. One of the first of these had been the planned ambush at Dripsy on January the 28th, which was surrounded after, as we have heard, Maria Lindsay informed the Crown forces. Within three weeks, the IRA in Cork had suffered two even more significant defeats. Using intelligence from an informer, a flying column was surrounded at Moran Abbey in northeast Cork on February the 15th. Four volunteers were killed and two others were taken prisoner and subsequently executed. On the same day in West Cork, the IRA had launched what proved to be a calamitous ambush on a train carrying soldiers at Upton train station. Poor intelligence on their part led them to believe that the soldiers would be concentrated together in one carriage, but they were in fact dispersed among civilians throughout the train. There was also far more soldiers than they had expected on board. When the IRA sprung the ambush, six civilians were killed and ten more sustained serious injuries. Three volunteers were killed, while Charlie Hurley, the commander of the West Cork Brigade, was seriously wounded and had to be sent to a remote safe house near Cross Barry to recover. The following night, February the 16th, four more IRA volunteers were caught and killed when the Essex Regiment caught them in the act of preparing an ambush. In total, the 3rd Cork Brigade had lost 11 volunteers in mid-February alone. These events all shaped the wider context to the Maria Lindsay kidnapping. It was on February the 17th that the IRA had arrived at her house and burned the building to the ground before taking her and her driver, James Clark, captive. However, it was after she had been taken prisoner that the IRA in Cork suffered an even worse setback than any I have discussed so far. Indeed, it was their worst defeat in the entire war. By February 1921, the flying column of the 4th Battalion of the 1st Cork Brigade, operating around Cork City, had established its headquarters around an old, disused farmhouse at Gary Lawrence at Clonmult. By Sunday the 20th, they had received orders to ready themselves to attack a military train outside Cork City. The three more senior officers left to carry out reconnaissance of the proposed ambush site. Now this left 21 volunteers behind and they continued to ready themselves to leave. Indeed, the two sentries who had been guarding the perimeter of the house returned to the building to pack their bags. This left the flying column entirely oblivious to the fact that 28 soldiers from the Hampshire Regiment of the British Army had just reached the locality. Operating on intelligence, from an informer who had spotted IRA volunteers in the locality, they first raided a farmhouse near where the flying column were based. On finding that empty, they began to move to a second house they identified from a map. It was inside this building that the 21 members of the flying column were based. Even though the soldiers were approaching their headquarters, these volunteers remained completely unaware until two of them left the house to go to get water from a well. Paddy Higgins, one of those inside the building, set the scene. Tea was being made about 3pm. We were packing up and preparing to leave and the guards were withdrawn. Two of our lads, John Joe Joyce and Michael Desmond, had gone to a well nearby for water. These latter two were unarmed as far as I know. At this point, someone looked out the window of the house and said that the military were surrounding the place. Shots rang out. It was the soldiers firing on Joyce and Desmond. We did not see the latter again. Now realising the grave risk they faced, the volunteers in the house began to prepare themselves for a breakout. Jack O'Connell fixed a bayonet to a rifle and he was the first to charge out of the building. While he took the approaching soldiers off guard and managed to escape, three following behind him, Michael Hallahan, 
James O'Hearn and Dick Hegarty were all shot and killed as they exited the building. The situation facing the 15 who were left behind inside the house was dire. When they tried to bore a hole through the gable of the house, they were immediately fired on by soldiers outside. As more soldiers arrived through the late afternoon, the situation became hopeless when the military set fire to the thatch roof of the building with grenades and petrol. Paddy Higgins again recalls the desperate situation they faced inside. Our ammunition was getting scarce. We had no hope of getting out into the open country and the place would soon be an inferno which meant we had to surrender or be burned alive. After repeated calls from the military outside to surrender, the majority of the column, seeing further resistance was pointless, decided to lay down their arms and they began to emerge one by one. However, what happened next embodied the growing brutality of the war now underway in Cork. Paddy Higgins explained what happened outside. We were lined up alongside an outhouse, with our hands up. The Tans came along and shot every man with the exception of three, namely Paddy O'Sullivan, Morris Moore and Sonny O'Leary, who had been wounded in the fight in the house. These three were saved from the Tans by the officer in charge of the military party. Now, two others survived. Miraculously, Paddy Higgins himself, while he was shot through the mouth, somehow managed to survive, while another volunteer, John Harty, who had been the first to emerge from the building, had been knocked unconscious by a rifle butt, which ultimately saved his life. However, in total, 12 IRA volunteers had been killed at Clonmult and eight taken prisoner. This defeat eclipsed the other setbacks suffered by the Cork IRA and it solidified the growing sense in the Republican movement across the region that they had a major problem with informants both in their communities and inside the movement itself. There have been several intelligence-led operations by Crown forces that had cost the lives of dozens of IRA volunteers. This was underscored a few weeks after Clonmult when a flying column of the 2nd Cork Brigade led by Liam Lynch was surrounded at their headquarters at Nad on March 10th. While Lynch escaped, four more volunteers were killed. Somewhat predictably, in an effort to stop similar ambushes and attacks, the IRA in Cork began to target suspected informers and agents within their own ranks and the wider community. Suspected informers were tried and in many cases executed if found guilty. In some instances, their bodies were publicly displayed with signs proclaiming their guilt. In other instances, they were disappeared, meaning they were buried in secret. In the aftermath of Clonmult, General Strickland presumably knew Maria Lindsay's life now hung by a thread. In such an aggressive war, if the IRA spared Lindsay, it would only be seen as a sign of weakness. However, surprisingly, in early March, he did receive another letter from Mrs. Lindsay. It echoed the sentiments of the first. Lindsay implied that she would be killed if Strickland pushed ahead with a court-martial scheduled to take place the following morning. Dennis Murphy and James Barrett are to be tried tomorrow. Will you please, for my sake, spare these two men? If these men are spared, I shall be allowed to go home. And if not, I cannot say what will be my fate. If you've been trying to call the IRA's bluff by ignoring the first letter, this second letter, which was proof that Mrs. Lindsay was still alive, may have confirmed in Strickland's head his suspicion that the IRA would balk at the idea of executing a middle-aged widow. Therefore, he ignored the second plea from Mrs. Lindsay. The court-martial she mentioned went ahead the following morning and one of the two men, Dennis Murphy, was sentenced to death. That letter was the last that General Strickland heard of Maria Lindsay for several months. News about her well-being or otherwise was only confirmed months later through a communique from Cahal Brua, the Minister for Defence in the Republican government. I have made inquiries from our local commanders into the case of Mrs Lindsay. The information sent us is that she was executed as a spy some months ago. The charge against her was that she was directly responsible for conveying to the enemy information which led to the execution of five of our men by the British authorities and the death of a sixth from wounds received in action. Maria Lindsay had in fact been shot not long after she wrote the second letter at some point between March the 11th and March the 16th, 1921. Those involved recalled different dates. 
She and her driver had been brought to a field where two graves had been dug and both were shot dead. Their bodies have never been found. While the fate of Maria Lindsay gained the greatest press attention, she was only one of dozens killed in Cork in similar circumstances, including other women. Indeed, four days after her execution, a woman called Bridget Noble was executed by the IRA in West Cork after being tried and found guilty as an informer. She had been seen frequenting the local RIC barracks. Her body was also hidden and has never been found. Now, the reason I focused on the story of Maria Lindsay is not because her specific killing had a major impact on the war. It didn't. However, it did reflect on the intensification of the war that was taking place. As mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to see the Cork IRA carrying out a killing of this nature a year previously. However, much had changed in those 12 months where IRA casualties were mounting at an alarming rate. The killing of Maria Lindsay was part of a much wider wave of killings by the IRA in Cork to root out informers not only in their own ranks, but also wider Irish society. These have become one of the most controversial aspects of the entire War of Independence in recent years. Now, there's no doubt through the course of the war, the Cork brigades of the IRA killed more suspected informers than any other brigade. These have become controversial, however, because it's been claimed that sectarianism was actually the motive, given that 30% of those killed were Protestants when they only accounted for 10% of the wider population. Now, this assertion is very questionable. Although anecdotal, the fact that one of the IRA volunteers centrally involved in the execution of Maria Lindsay, Frank Busteed, was himself a Protestant, does warn against a simplistic understanding of this phase of the war. The History Department of University College Cork, who published the excellent Atlas of the Irish Revolution, provide a more substantive rebuttal on their website against the idea that these killings were sectarian in nature. Whilst Cork Protestants were certainly overrepresented among those disappeared as suspected spies and informers killed in Cork, the number of documented cases are still fairly small in the wider context of fatalities during the conflict at large. Furthermore, Protestants were targeted for the most part for their suspected or active loyalist opposition rather than their religious denomination and the significance of these killings has been somewhat exaggerated on the supposition that there was an underlying sectarian motive to these killings, an interpretation advanced as a propaganda tactic on the British side at the time. Motives aside, there's no question that by the spring of 1921, the war across the South and particularly the war in Cork had unquestionably reached a new level of ferocity. The words of one of those involved in these events, the engineering officer of the IRA's 1st Cork Brigade, Michael O'Donoghue, summarised the situation in Cork at this time. It was a grim and gruesome competition in terrorism, but no stark military necessity obsessed the British Army of occupation. While desperate instincts of self-preservation and stark ruthless resistance motivated the merciless retaliation of the Irish Republican Army. O'Donoghue's description of the IRA's motivations as one of self-preservation highlights the fact that the organisation were unquestionably on the back foot by March 1921. This was the context to what proved to be one of the largest engagements of the entire war. After a Republican prisoner broke under interrogation, the Crown forces were presented with a great opportunity. They learned the location of the headquarters of one of the IRA's largest flying columns. Led by Tom Barry, the man who had been the brains behind the Kill Michael ambush, 104 volunteers were quartered near Cross Barry. Hundreds of soldiers were mobilised in what could prove to be a decisive encounter if the Crown forces could trap this flying column. When the Crown forces learned of a major concentration of IRA volunteers, 104 in total, they descended on the Crossbury area in an effort to trap them. As we've seen throughout the series, the numbers involved in any engagement in the Irish War of Independence was always smaller than more conventional conflicts. Nevertheless, on this occasion, hundreds of members of the Crown forces were mobilised. They began a large sweep through the area, 
One of those caught up in this was Charlie Hurley, the commander of the 3rd Cork Brigade. Hurley, as we heard earlier, was convalescing in a safe house in the Crossbarry area after he had been wounded at the Upton train ambush. On this occasion, he was shot dead as he tried to escape. However, the flying column, led by Tom Barry, fought their way out of what seemed like certain annihilation. In total, at Crossbarry, 11 British soldiers were killed and four wounded, while four IRA volunteers lost their lives. Now, Crossbarry is regarded as an IRA victory, but there's no denying that the trajectory of the war was deeply concerning for the Republican movement. Even Crossbarry, where the IRA had shown great skill and determination in fighting their way out, was ultimately a defensive action. While the IRA remained intact in Cork, it was hard to see them surviving for long in this situation. If the war continued on its current trajectory, the Crown forces would eventually score a crushing victory like the one Crossbarry had offered them. When the IRA's publication on Togluk was published in March, it was predictably defiant, saying, It is now generally realised and even admitted by the enemy that his new campaign of intensified terrorism, massacres and burnings and drastic military measures has proved a hopeless failure. However, the same article contained hints that the GHQ, the general headquarters of the IRA, were concerned about the impact recent events were having on the Cork IRA as it urged volunteers in other parts of the country to take up the mantle. In other parts of the country, however, things are still very unsatisfactory. It affects no credit on the volunteers in these districts that they should leave the gallant men of the South to bear all the brunt of the enemy's activities and thus help to make the military problem much simpler for the enemy. However, while the IRA had cause for concern in the spring of 1921, the British administration in Dublin Castle and also the British government in London, as well as the military authorities, were all pessimistic about their overall outlook. While things seemed to be heading in the right direction, complete victory still was years away. The military remained unhappy about the terms of martial law which had been brought in to escalate the war across the south. Most of the country, including Dublin, still remained outside the jurisdiction of the military government, so this escalation had really only targeted about one third of the island. Even if it was extended across the entire island, the experience in Cork and the surrounding region across the south illustrated some major problems with some of the conditions the government had imposed on the military, which limited the effectiveness of martial law. For example, the British Army had been curtailed by the fact that the police and the civilian courts were still in operation. This led to a conflict with the police in general over who had supremacy and at least on one occasion a gun battle had broken out between police and military units. The continued existence of the civilian courts led to a somewhat bizarre situation when an IRA prisoner, J.J. Egan, sentenced to death in Limerick in June under the terms of martial law was able to take a case against General Neville McCready that this had been illegal. It's easy to see why, later on, the British Army would claim it was fighting with one hand behind its back. However, more concerning than any of these specific military issues were the wider political questions that remained. It had long become clear that the war in Ireland could not be viewed in purely military terms. The way military tactics and operations were viewed by the public at home and abroad was crucial, and British tactics were being condemned internationally. For example, in Limerick, also under martial law, the killing of the mayor of Limerick, George Clancy, and his predecessor, Michael O'Callaghan, on the night of March 7th, by members of the Auxiliary Division, acting in concert with an intelligence officer, was reported across the world. It was on the front page of the New York Times, above the fold. All this, though, led to major strategic questions on behalf of the British government and the military. While the escalation of the war in Cork appeared to show signs of working, few believed British politicians could or would politically stand over the ensuing casualties if martial law was extended elsewhere, particularly in Dublin. Finally, the long-term problem that the British government had faced since the war began remained. While in their propaganda they tried to present the IRA as a violent minority, internal documents revealed that they were very much aware that the vast majority of the Irish population outside the northeast of the island were hostile and opposed to British rule. This begged the question, in the event of an emphatic victory over the IRA, 
How would the British government govern an extremely hostile population without extreme repression? In some readings of the situation, it appeared that there was no end to conflict of one kind or another in Ireland in the foreseeable future. Now, in this situation, where both sides were increasingly pessimistic, the logical way forward was peace talks. However, this was easier said than done. As we've seen in previous episodes, the last attempt to establish a truce and talks had been the initiative of Archbishop Patrick Clune in December 1920. However, as we saw in episode 21, when those talks had collapsed in late December, peace had actually seemed further away than ever. Irish Republicans had walked away even more distrustful of the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George than they had been, while the British government thought the Republican movement was desperate for peace and therefore felt no great rush to agree on a truce until they had very favourable terms. So while peace initiatives had continued right through the dark months of January, February and March, they had gained little traction at the highest levels. Indeed, as late as May the 12th, 1921, when the British cabinet discussed the idea of calling a truce to allow elections be held in Ireland, they rejected it by a majority of nine to five votes. The military leadership in Dublin were also opposed to a truce. While they were pessimistic about the long-term prospects in the war, they argued a truce would just be used by the IRA to reorganise. It was clear that getting from war to peace was increasingly like having a wolf by the ears. Arguably, letting go of war was going to be the most difficult and dangerous point. Indeed, the Clune Peace Initiative in December 1920 had illustrated that if it was done incorrectly, it could actually make situations worse. Events in Dublin in late May would highlight precisely how difficult and delicate the process of moving from war to peace could be even in a situation where both sides were pessimistic about the outcome of the conflict. By May 1921, the Republican leadership had long accepted that the war could only end through peace talks. There was no chance of the IRA militarily driving the Crown forces from Ireland. While the IRA in Cork had suffered heavy losses through early 1921, the overall prognosis from a military point of view was not good anywhere on the island. Internment of Republican activists had continued and by the summer, 4,500 people were being held in jails and camps across Ireland. These included leading figures such as Sean Moylan and Sean McKeown. A universal problem all across the island for IRA units was the chronic lack of weapons and ammunition. There had been attempts to resolve this at both a local and national level, but these had fallen through, leaving volunteers dependent on weapons stolen from the Crown forces and small shipments from the IRA in Britain. But this severely limited their ability to act. Meanwhile, there was a growing sense that British intelligence were closing in around the Republican leadership. In a raid in February 1921, the papers of the IRA Chief of Staff were seized for the second time during the war, while Michael Collins was almost captured in May 1921 during a raid on his offices. He only escaped because he was not present, although this was only by accident. However, while this left them increasingly open to peace talks, in the absence of any concrete initiatives from London, the war continued. Through the spring of 1921, the Dublin Brigade of the IRA had begun to escalate their activities. The month of April witnessed dozens of smaller raids and attacks on Crown forces. However, in May, they dramatically shifted strategy. The Republican military strategy had almost been exclusively the prerogative of the IRA leadership at a local and national level. However, in May, the Doyle, the Republican Parliament, demanded the IRA launch a major offensive in Dublin for propaganda reasons. Now, such a move harked back to the 1916 Rising, which in military terms had been a failure, and the IRA leadership had long abandoned what would be called spectacular large-scale operations in favour of guerrilla warfare. However, several political leaders, including notably Eamon de Valera, now insisted on a change of tactics. This led to a huge operation in Dublin to target a symbol of British power in the city. The Dublin Brigade would mobilise well over 100 volunteers for an assault on the Customs House, a large 18th century administrative building located on the North Quays, which was considered one of the finest buildings in Dublin. 
Aside from Dublin Castle, there were few other buildings that represented British power in Ireland. The Customs House was, after all, the nerve centre of the British taxation system. On May the 25th, 1921, about 160 volunteers took up positions around this building, which was vast in scale. The front was 114 metres long and it was 35 metres deep and contained two internal courtyards. On a prearranged signal, numerous IRA squads rushed the complex entering at 1pm, easily overpowering the guards on duty. One staff member was shot dead when he tried to call the police as the volunteers gathered the staff in the main atrium of the building. After this, they methodically set about burning this symbol of British power in Ireland by setting fires throughout the complex. The Freeman's Journal reported on the scene. The custom house blazed fiercely and it was evident from the start that there was no hope of saving the building. Probably not since the insurrection of Easter week 1916 did the people of Dublin experience such a series of startling events as those which were witnessed yesterday. However, somewhat inevitably, large numbers of Crown forces descended on the Customs House within minutes, leading to a major gun battle in Dublin city centre. The IRA, in their meticulous planning, had prepared for such an eventuality, and dozens of volunteers lay in wait in side streets around the Customs House. Again, the Freeman's Journal reported the scene in the city centre. Rifle, revolver and machine gun fire with intermittent explosions echoed through Beresford Place during the afternoon and dead and wounded lay at different points. By the day's end, the Customs House was a smouldering ruin but the Dublin Brigade of the IRA suffered huge casualties. Five had been killed and around 80 taken prisoner. Four civilians were also killed in the crossfire. While the impact on the Dublin IRA has been overstated, there was no way they could pursue a wider strategy based on these tactics, given the huge casualty rates involved. However, the act of burning thousands of records relating to taxation and land ownership was a major symbolic blow to British authority in Ireland. Furthermore, the fact that the IRA could strike at such a building in the heart of Dublin naturally undermined claims that the Crown forces were gaining the upper hand. Sean Prendergast, an IRA volunteer who we met in part 18 when he was present at the death of Sean Tracy, recalled this operation. One of the most important pillars of the British administration in Ireland went up in fire and smoke. The attack on the Customs House had far-reaching consequences. It unquestionably demonstrated that the Republican movement had an ability to fight on, something that had the potential to bring politicians in London to the negotiating table. Although it is very questionable whether the large number of volunteers involved could have had the same effect in less risky and costly targets. However, while the Republican movement's continued determination did lead to growing calls for talks on both sides of the Irish Sea, conversely, individual attacks did have the potential to ratchet up a desire for vengeance in Britain, which would only benefit the opponents of peace talks. This had, after all, been one of the reasons cited by the British as to why the Clune peace talks had failed. Crucially, though, it also took place while a key deadline of June 1921 was looming on the horizon. This was clearly going to be a crunch moment in the entire conflict. While the British cabinet had rejected the idea of a truce on May the 12th, they could not avoid what was a momentous deadline in June. The previous December, they had passed the Government of Ireland Act. This is fully explained in episode 21, but in short, it granted home rule to Ireland, but it did partition the island into two jurisdictions, one ruled from Dublin and the other from Belfast. Nationalists of all stripes had rejected its terms, while Ulster Unionists had embraced the Act because, under its provisions, they would dominate the Belfast Parliament and thereby could guarantee that they would be able to maintain the union with Britain in the northeast of Ireland, at least. The Act, however, also had a dramatic clause that had not really been talked about when it had been passed in December 1920. Under its terms, if these parliaments, that of Belfast and that of Dublin, did not open, Ireland was to be ruled as a crown colony under martial law. Now, the elections to these respective parliaments had already taken place in late May and Unionists, as was to be expected, had dominated the elections for the Belfast Parliament. Given they supported the institution, 
it was clearly going to meet and therefore the six northeastern counties under the Belfast Parliament's jurisdiction would not be subject to martial law. However, in Dublin the situation was very different. Republicans committed to boycotting the Parliament had taken 120 of the 124 seats, meaning it would never open. Therefore, as things stood, unless the British government intervened, the remaining 26 counties, including Dublin, would be ruled as a crown colony under martial law, where the British army would be put in control. Now, the commander-in-chief in Ireland, Neville McCready, spelled out the choice that faced the government at this crucial moment in the war when he said, It is a case of all out or get out. What McCready was getting at here was that they needed to escalate the war to win it or begin peace talks. However, McCready himself did not believe an escalation would work. He elaborated on his view as he looked to the future in the summer of 1921. There is, of course, one or two wild people about who still hold the absurd idea that if you go on killing long enough, peace will ensue. I do not believe it for a moment, but I do believe the more people that are killed, the more difficult will be the final solution. Meanwhile, in London, the British government were, however, by no means as pessimistic as MacReady. Lloyd George was coming to the opinion that while it might take a few years and it might be what he termed unpleasant business, a victory would ultimately preserve the empire and would be worth it. This, however, would be a huge step and one that could have huge international consequences for Britain. While British politicians had a tendency to put Ireland on the long finger, they could no longer do this in June 1921. They had to make a decision. A deadline imposed by the Government of Ireland Act loomed and they had to decide whether they were going to press ahead with martial law and escalate the war further or, if not, for the first time in the war, seriously entertain the idea of peace talks with the Irish Republican movement. Part 2 of Endgame is out in two days' time. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>